Michael O'Hanlon needs a little introduction to the Baltimore Council. Um, he is one of the most thoughtful and uh, knowledgeable analysts of international affairs in the country, uh, one of the, and one of the most prolific writers. Uh, he's constantly coming up with new approaches to help us understand <coughs> security risks in today's world. Uh, Dr. O'Hanlon has multiple degrees from Princeton, the last of which is a PhD in public affairs <coughs> and international relations from the Woodrow Wilson School. He's the director of research now at uh, in, in, in research in foreign policy at the Brookings Institution in Washington. Uh, he is an adjunct professor at Columbia, Georgetown, and George Washington Universities. I don't know quite how you find time for all these things. <laughs> um, he's on the adv he has been on the advisory board of the CIA um, and the DOD. Uh, this is, by my count, the 12th appearance at the Baltimore Council. I think uh, he's the most popular speaker in the history of the council. <clears throat> I give you Dr. Michael O'Hanlon. Thank you, my friend, Roy. That was way too generous. It's wonderful to see you all and be back in Baltimore. And this is a place where I've got such fantastic memories. It's just one of the greatest communities, being able to look out over Raven Stadium, and they're going to win next year. And, 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 and a lot of us in Washington are rooting for them, by the way, uh, in case you were wondering. But I thought that tonight what I would do with this conversation, and I hope that you'll you know, raise your thoughts and comments and questions about whatever topics you wish in the second part of the proceedings. But I'm going to talk a little bit about the book and a little bit about history, because despite these warm words and compliments, uh, I never felt like I knew enough about my field and especially about military history. And this is partly a function of the way in which public policy is taught in the United States, political science tends to be a little bit more quantitative, tends to be a little bit more abstract or arcane. People look for big theories that explain everything. And I went through and got a PhD in that field and went into security studies and never felt like I had really learned the basics. And then I would get embarrassed by my friends who were in the military, a couple of whom I went to graduate school with. And just to drop one name, David Petraeus, who always seemed to know his military history better than I did. And as the years went by, this really got me mad because I'm thinking he's out there actually doing something with his life. I'm just studying all the time, and he knows it better than I do. Last Friday, we had the Brookings launch of my book, Military History for the Modern Strategist. And I was blessed and honored to have retired General uh, Stanley McChrystal as part of this. And he's also a fantastic student of military history, and a lot of people are. And history is so important even as we make policy today, for all sorts of reasons. You draw inspiration from what's happened before. You draw lessons of what not to do from what's happened before. And you also appreciate the unpredictability and difficulty of war if you study history. And it's always easy living in a high-tech society, living in a place like this Washington National Capital Area, where we've got Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab, and we've got Aberdeen Testing Ground, and we've got all the gems and jewels of our country in terms of technological research and advancement. It's always tempting here and probably in Beijing and certainly in Moscow a year ago to think that you've got the next war figured out and that with the new tactics, the new technologies, things are going to be easier, quicker, faster, and more decisive. And that attitude is almost always wrong. So what I want to do is um, tell that story a little bit tonight with the use of one of my wars, the Civil War, the American Civil War. And again, living around here, it's a, a war that we tend to think about a lot. But I also want to tee up the three observations or central lessons that I drew from this project, which, by the way, was sort of a perfect COVID project because you know, my wife once asked me recently, do you want to retire soon? And I said, why would I retire? I've already got the life I would want in retirement, except I'm getting paid to do it. And, I, and, I, and I'm getting listened to. And, 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 and by the way, you, Kathy, of all people, should not want me to retire because this you know, tonight I get to go speak to the Baltimore Council. They're going to listen, or at least for the first few minutes. And, and whereas otherwise, you'd be on the receiving end of whatever wisdom I thought I'd come up with that day all the time. Uh, so this was a great COVID project because I got to do, frankly, I got to complete my remedial education in military history, which I had been attempting for 30 years after graduate school, but I never really had a concentrated two to three year period to really delve in 
and look at each of these wars in detail. So I don't claim to be a military historian, but I did try to, book about, try to write a book about military history for the modern strategist, which is what I've been trying to be my whole life and what I want to see if I can impart to others. Let me begin with the three broad lessons that I drew from looking at the Civil War, World War I, World War II, and then Korea, Vietnam together, and then Iraq, Afghanistan together. So five major chapters. America's big war, sort of a industrial scale, large scale mobilization, the wars that entailed and involved most of our society, most of our economy. So the wars that therefore perhaps are the most relevant looking forward. That was the logic of what I try to do and why I chose those five chapters, those seven conflicts. So as I study them, I thought that three powerful lessons emerged. And truth be told, I didn't make up really any of them, or certainly not the first one. And uh, I don't, probably just tweaked the last two compared to things I had read. But I, I didn't write this book as a modern American political scientist trying to come up with the new theory of war. I wanted to reinforce the time-tested verities, the things we forget, the central realities and, and truths that we need to remember as policymakers and as voters going forward. And lesson one is that war is almost always harder, longer and more difficult and bloodier than people expect at the beginning. And by the way, if you thought that we have gotten over this today, don't forget that for all the brilliance of the CIA in foreseeing that Putin was going to attack Ukraine a year ago, the CIA thought Putin would win in four days. We, our, our intelligence community, and I have so many friends in that community, and I was on the advisory board at the CIA, they are brilliant. And we spend $80 billion a year on intelligence in the United States, and we thought the war would be over in four days. So it's a human tendency. There was a possibility it would be over in four days. And if the CIA hadn't shared with President Zelensky what we knew about the Russian plans, it, it might have been. So I'm not trying to paint with a broad brush and critique too harshly. But still, lesson one, war is almost always harder than most of the belligerents and certainly most of the attackers, the initial initiators of conflict, expect. Lesson two sounds almost as obvious and maybe it is, but it's worth remembering. Because as my colleague Bob Kagan, and your future speaker in a couple of weeks, said when he released his book on history uh, a few weeks ago, and I had the privilege to be part of that event at Brookings, he said, you know, we, we make history going forward, but we learn it looking backward, which means it's very hard to put yourself in the shoes of people at the time. And it's also very hard to imagine that the wars could have turned out any way other than how they did. But the outcomes in war are unpredictable. That's lesson two. And I try to make this point using a number of the conflicts. Maybe we can get into this more in discussion. I'll just lay out these lessons now and then talk about the Civil War and then look forward to your, your thoughts and reflections. Lesson three is of a somewhat different ilk, but it's that since 1945, the United States, I think, has had an extremely successful overall foreign policy, even though it's no longer quite an era of interstate peace, Roy, and you were right to, uh, uh, to tease me gently on the fact that two years ago, I wrote a book hearkening to the fact or underscoring the fact that there wasn't interstate war, and now there is. But it's still an era of great power peace. The, the, the great powers are not fighting each other directly. And that's a very good thing. It's still an era despite COVID, despite financial setbacks and all sorts of problems with more democracy and more prosperity for the human race than ever before. And it's an era where we have loosely aligned within the US led alliance system, two thirds of all world GDP on our side and two thirds of world military spending on our side. And going back to my graduate school days, that's not what my professors of international relations really thought would happen if the Cold War ended. You know, balance of power theory suggests that people will create opposing blocks. And right now, Russia and China are doing a little bit of that. But what's overwhelming in terms of the thrust of history over the last three to four decades is that most of the world's major industrial and economic powers want to stay with us, even when they don't like us, even when they disagree with what we do, even when we elect people like Donald Trump to the presidency who seem to have contempt for alliances. What will, uh, I hope we don't push that test too far. Uh, but, but nonetheless, what's been remarkable is that we've actually managed to 
sustain and enlarge this community of democracies even after the Cold War ended. I'm not necessarily endorsing every part of the NATO expansion enterprise, but, but it's still a striking reality that we've done this. We've had a successful grand strategy. The world is generally peaceful, prosperous, and democratic, and yet we've lost or at best stalemated all of our major wars since 1945. We're good at grand strategy. We're bad at war since 1945. And I said this on Friday at Brookings with General McChrystal, just to my left, who I love. I love that guy. And I said to him, I don't blame you guys in uniform for this. I blame us, the broader country, the civilian decision-making process, the politics, the staying power. I finished that point. And General McChrystal said, uh, well, Mike, I, I, I agree with almost all of your book and almost all of what you said today, but I'm not going to let us off, us soldiers off that easy. And I'm not going to accept your, your, your sort of exemption. Uh, I think we deserve a lot of the blame, too, for the mistakes that have been made. But collectively, we have lost two big wars since 1945, Vietnam and Afghanistan. And we've stalemated two others, Korea and Iraq. Iraq's sort of too soon to say. Certainly not a win. I hope it's not a defeat. So we're sort of, by football reckoning, 0-2-2 two two in major wars. Now, you could say, well, Desert Storm, the you know, uh, liberation of Kuwait after Saddam took it in 1991, counts for a big win. That's fine. I'm not trying to overstate my argument. But I folded Iraq and Desert Storm into the broader experience of Iraq of the last 35 years. And if you look at it as a comprehensive entity over that period of time, I don't think it's an easy or big win. Uh, it's a long slog and maybe a stalemate at best. You know, the Iraqis are still struggling. They may be better off in some ways than they would have been under Saddam and his sons, but they certainly haven't reached a peaceful stability. And so I think it's too soon to call that one. So we're 0-2-2, two two, by my reckoning, since 1945 in military operation, major military operations. And yet, we've had the greatest, most successful grand strategy of any power in history over a sustained period. That's just sort of something to mull over. And you could, you know, we could have a debate about what that means, even if you agree with that basic statement, what it means and what it should say about guiding us going forward is debatable. But we can come back to the lessons that war is almost always harder and longer than expected, that war is rarely, the outcomes of war rarely preordained, and that America has an excellent record as a superpower in grand strategy terms, but a very mediocre record as a military combatant since 1945. Those are my three observations from the book. I wasn't trying to be original. I wasn't trying to, you know, land myself on the New York Times bestseller list. Although if you want to help me get there tonight, please, <laughs> please feel free. But I was just trying to say, these are the things that struck me after just pouring myself into this history uh, for these last two years. So that's one aspect to the book that I wanted to write about. But the main thing I wanted to do was just tell the history at a broad conceptual and chronological level. Because I have a confession to make to you, I'm not a big military history buff. I don't like reading this stuff for fun. I never go home at the end of a work day and say to my wife, honey, would you turn off the Ravens game so I can read about the Battle of Trafalgar? Never <laughs> once done that in my whole life. And it, you know, I, I, I read about military history because I feel like I should know about it, not because I enjoy it. Now, probably some people in this room enjoy it more than I do. But what I wanted to do was to understand it at a strategic and conceptual level. Or what military planners, and I know there are a number, uh, including the general here tonight, often describe as the operational level of war, the campaign level. And what I mean by a campaign in military terms is a sequence of engagements, operations, and battles over a period of time, generally lasting months, over a geographic zone, generally on dimensions of hundreds of miles, in service of a broader strategic goal. So it's, it's sort of what connects the battles and what explains the battles and what the battles are trying to achieve in the mind of the commanders. And General McChrystal said on Friday, he said, Mike's so correct to stay at that level because as a retired general and other generals he knows, you know, it's very hard not to get drawn into the tactics, into the close fight. And that's obviously important. You got to win the close fight to make the operational and strategic concepts work. But for a student of history who's trying to draw lessons for today, it's also useful 
to go out to 30,000 feet. So this is a book about military history from 30,000 feet. It's not from ground level. It's not the tactical and personal level so much. I mean, I have a lot of, you know, I mean, who could write about the Civil War and not have like six quotes from Lincoln? The guy is just a soundbite machine. And, and, and there's so many other people from that period who are brilliant just to listen to, witty and, and so penetrating and wise in their thoughts. And I'll mention a couple in just a second. But, but what I really try to do is stay at 30,000 feet, not, not 100 miles up. You know, there's, there's some real tactical detail and a lot of battles do get mentioned, but they get mentioned in the spirit of explaining a sequence or a flow of operations over a period of months. So that's just a frame for you what the book's about. So now what I want to do in the rest of my opening, uh, and this is the other main goal that I set for myself, and I hope you won't mind too much. I wanted to do a quick visit through Civil War history, but I'm not going to throw battlefield after battlefield after you, or you know, at your brains and at your ears. I'm going to mention seven campaigns. Seven campaigns. And I think if you get these seven campaigns, you mostly understand the Civil War. And so maybe like most authors, I wrote this book out of pure selfishness that I just wanted to be able to connect all those plaques that I see in the Washington area about this battle and that battle together so that they would make sense. Because usually I always, you know, I'm driving by and I'm like becoming a traffic hazard as I try to read the rest of the plaque. And maybe on a good day, I go out and walk one of the battlefields. But, um, you know, it still doesn't all fit together. But in the book, I try to make it fit together a little bit for this war and other wars. It doesn't work equally well for every war, but it works pretty well for most to stay at this campaign level of what were, over a period of months, the successive engagements, battles, operations that a given commander you know, a, a sector or theater commander employed to try to service an overall strategy to end the war on favorable terms. So let me now, with apologies to those of you who don't love your Civil War history enough to want to hear about all seven, or who know it better than I do, and I bet there are a few of you who do, and, and will find this uh, superficial. Nonetheless, let me try to say what I think the seven most important campaigns of the Civil War were in military terms. I'm not going to talk so much about Lincoln's brilliance and trying to make sure the border states stayed with the Union and that, and that the uh, you know, British didn't go and support the Confederates. I'm not going to talk so much about that political lead up to battle. I'm going to talk more about the major sequence of the big fights. So as I would define it, there was a lot of skirmishing, a lot of localized engagements in 1861. But as we got into 1862, the infamous General McClellan, who was the commander of overall Union forces and a pretty good logistician, previously been, I think, a railroad executive and knew a, a bit about organizing. Very pompous 34-year-old guy who um, you know, most people probably didn't really like. But nonetheless, um, Lincoln thought he probably was the best guy for the job. Well, McClellan organized a pretty impressive uh, amphibious operation that sitting here on the banks of the Chesapeake will appreciate because it involved loading up 100,000 Union soldiers around the Washington area and sailing them south through the Chesapeake to the peninsula between the James and the York rivers just east of Richmond. And his goal was take those forces there. They'll be unopposed. The, the Confederates didn't have many ships that could do much about that. They had one or two we had to keep an eye on. But for the most part, that mission would be likely unopposed. But it was well organized. And it brought the 100,000 troops down successfully, and they offloaded with their equipment. It's pretty impressive uh, as an operation so far, even though it was on a post. And then McClellan was going to march on Richmond and hopefully destroy enough of Lee's army. The Confederates would lose heart or capture Richmond, the capital, and maybe they would give up. And McClellan might have had the forces necessary to do the job, except for two things. One, his own personality, because he was always afraid of his shadow. And by the way, I say this as a person who hasn't commanded troops in battle. I bet you I'd be afraid of my shadow, too. And McClellan sort of knew that the Union, in a way, could afford to be patient because they had three to four times the population base, 10 times the industrial capacity of the South. And if it took a little while to get his forces in position, so be it. And we all read these Civil War histories as if we People knew on both sides exactly how many troops were facing each other. 
Uh, nobody knew. And McClellan was always inclined to overestimate the enemy and underestimate himself. In some realms of life, that's considered to be a virtue, like prudence. But in war, um, if you take that logic too far, you wind up paralyzing yourself. So that was one big problem. And uh, the other big problem, which gets to campaign number two, which overlaps with campaign number one, Stonewall Jackson was sent off by Lee, but by General Lee, into the Shenandoah Valley with only about 17,000 troops. But Jackson was famous for his discipline, for his work ethic, for his religious uh, fervor, for his conviction that the South was in the right. And so with those 17,000 troops, he kept sort of like Muhammad Ali, punching here and punching there, and the Union was confused. They assumed he was probably two or three times as big as he really was. And so General McDowell, who had additional Union forces up in this you know, vicinity uh, west of Washington, and who was supposed to come down and reinforce McClellan to make this attack on Richmond more successful, McDowell was ultimately held back by President Lincoln to deal with this pesky Stonewall Jackson figure who we now know is sort of pesky, but at the time, people thought he had a big sledgehammer and might be in range of Washington, and therefore had to be stymied. So McClellan, already afraid of his own shadow, now learns he's not going to get McDowell's reinforcements. And so he fights very tentatively at places like Seven Pines and the Seven Days Battle in the summer of 1862. And then basically, even though he's doing okay, basically stops trying and decides to call it a fighting season. So. Campaign one is McClellan coming down by boat, making some tentative, timid attempts at Richmond, and then retracting his forces. Campaign two, which overlaps with that, is Stonewall Jackson uh, sort of, you know, badgering and annoying, harassing Union forces and scaring them into thinking they better protect the capital of Washington, D.C., and therefore better not allow McDowell's reinforcements to come south. So that, again, sort of reinforces the paralysis. All of this comes to a conclusion for the year in terms of the fighting season in Virginia with the Second Battle of Manassas in August of 1862. And that's sort of Stonewall Jackson's, one of his great hurrahs, where, uh, again, having kept Union forces uncertain about where he is, they can't bring all their strength to bear. And in that same general vicinity where the Confederates had performed well in July of 1861. They performed well in August of 1862. So that's the first two campaigns. This sets up the third campaign, which is Lee going north. Lee coming into the great state of Maryland, and then in the summer of 1863, even further. And of course, the two big battles are Antietam and Gettysburg. Now, they are, in a way, you know, you could quibble with me, uh, whether they should be viewed as one, one campaign because Lee went to Antietam out by Harper's Ferry, crossed over, was defeated by McClellan because we had some intelligence luck on the Union side and they figured out what Lee was up to. McClellan didn't really pursue his advantage, however, and ultimately Lincoln accused him of, of having a case of the slows. These were, always the these were also the times where Lincoln would say to McClellan things like, hey, General, if you don't want to use your army, could I borrow it for a while? So, you know, again, Lincoln, the master of the soundbite. Um, and, and, and so Lee went north, crossed the river, was defeated in Antietam, managed the escape that a lot of historians think he shouldn't have been allowed to uh, achieve, brought most of his forces back to Virginia, and would try again the following summer at Gettysburg before being defeated there again. So I define campaign number three as Lee's effort to go north. Lee's purpose was not really you know, to conquer Annapolis, Baltimore, Washington, New York. He didn't have the forces for that. What he wanted to do was shock the north into thinking that he could really hurt them in their homeland, maybe even make a, a, a try at arresting President Lincoln, because the Confederates did have a couple of schemes to try that over the course of the war but mostly just shock the North into thinking this war is not worth fighting, and maybe convince the British and other European powers to recognize the Confederacy as an independent country. So that was sort of the gist of Lee's thinking. It turned out probably to be a bad calculation. Lee might have been better off preserving his forces to fight quasi-defensive slash guerrilla warfare in the South and try to tire the North out that way. But you know, this was a period when 
the martial sort of instinct was to go win the big battle. And Lee was certainly a product of that way of thinking. So even though he was probably a master tactician in some ways, at a more strategic level, he couldn't resist going for the big win. And uh, it may have been his undoing, because after Gettysburg, he offered his resignation and never really got his momentum back. But anyway, halfway through campaign three is campaign four. So these overlap a little. It's not a completely simple uh, diagram that I can draw on a map or on a timeline. But campaign number four, in between Antietam and Gettysburg, is the North's complete failure to do anything well on the battlefield under Generals Burnside and Hooker, who replaced McClellan successively. And Burnside came south and tried to fight the Battle of Fredericksburg in December of 1862 and just got trounced, uh, trying to move forces across an open field, one of the most tactically inept uh, performances of the entire Civil War, and gave the Confederates a little bit of momentum just after they had lost at Antietam. And so it was sort of a tough period of time. You know, and Lincoln was about to formalize the Emancipation Procul Proclamation because he used Antietam to promise, in, in back in September, to promise that would be forthcoming. And General Burnside didn't do Lincoln any favors by basically suffering this massive defeat at Fredericksburg in December. But Lincoln went ahead with the Emancipation anyway and, and then found a new general, General Hooker. And then Hooker got himself trounced at Chancellorsville and a couple other battles in the spring of 1863. However, so that's the that's campaign number four. It, it, you know, it's you know again overlapping with Lee's attempt to go north. And after Chancellorsville, you know, it's sort of like in football, you get a little bit too much confidence, you overreach. And so after Chancellorsville, the Confederates are feeling good. Lee decides it's time to go north again, and he winds winds up overextending and losing in Gettysburg. But the other important thing about Chancellorsville the battle there in May of 1862. Two more things I would say that, that that battle does need to be understood and remembered for. One is that's where Stonewall Jackson died, but only after executing this incredibly brilliant tactical maneuver to surprise the Union flank by this small path in the forest. And if you've been down there, it's, you know, it's still very forested to this day. You can imagine how in May, it would have been really hard to see people coming. And what they decided to do on the Confederate side was keep a small force in the center of the expected attack that Lee would maintain, and then send Stonewall Jackson around to do the flank, uh, which was the big success. But Jackson was shot in the arm by his own men, and the arm was amputated, got infected, and he later died. Uh, and before he died, but after he was shot, uh, Lee, uh, in one of his famous quotes, said, well, Jackson may have lost his left arm, but I just lost my right arm losing Jackson. And Lee was more prescient than he realized because Jackson was soon to die. But somehow, Lee decides this is the moment to go do the big attack 100 miles north in Pennsylvania. And so that leads to the Gettysburg showdown and some pretty bad tactics on the Confederate side, uh, like Pickett's Charge, which, which, which wind up producing the defeat. And then Lee, probably from that point on, it's not clear Lee ever really thought the South could win. Up until that point, he thought maybe they could. So that's the first four campaigns. The last three, and I'll be done. And you'll be done with the Civil War for tonight if you want to be. So uh, just hang in there a little bit longer. But we have to bring in General Grant. And General Grant, as many of you will know, starts to emerge really at the Battle of Shiloh in April of 1862 out in Kentucky. And then... Um, and then, oh, sorry, Tennessee, and, and, and then winds up um, in pursuit of Confederate forces on the way to Vicksburg, Vicksburg on the Mississippi River, which is the only part of the Mississippi that by this point in late 1862, early 1863, the Confederates still hold, because your buddy uh, Admiral Farragut, our namesake of public squares down in Washington, who had been around since the fabled War of 1812 when Baltimore gave us the Star Spangled Banner, uh, that Admiral Farragut liberated New Orleans, sailing up river with an armada and defeating the relatively lightly uh, armed Confederate positions, but still Vicksburg held for the South. And Grant, who was by this point in charge of the uh, investment and attack against Vicksburg, couldn't quite figure out what to do. And all through the winter months of early 1863, he was stuck 
in these swampy, mosquito infested, cold, damp. I mean, it was just that wrong temperature where mosquitoes can live, but nobody's comfortable uh, as a human. And, and, uh, he, and he couldn't find terrain that was solid enough to attack. And he, he didn't know what to do. So he finally decided, you know, he's on the east side of the river, Vicksburg's on the east side, but he has to get over to the west side. It's the only way to get from north of Vicksburg to south of Vicksburg. And so what he does is he takes his available shipping moves his soldiers across the Mississippi and disembarks them, brings his, his ships back empty. They then run down the river as fast as they can, trying to get past all those Confederate guns that are protecting Vicksburg. But Grant's thinking is, well, if I lose a few ships that have no soldiers on them, that's, I, I, can, I can deal with that. So the ships get south. The soldiers complete their march. They re-embark on the ships, cross back, to the east side. Now they're cut off from their major railroads because they're on the wrong side of Vicksburg. They're on the south side, not the north, but at least they have solid land to start digging trenches. And they start digging their trenches closer and closer and closer to the city. And if, you know, Grant wrote beautiful memoirs that I recommend to anybody uh, who might enjoy this kind of stuff. But to the time when Grant is almost at his giddiest in his memoirs is when he's talking about finally getting south of Vicksburg and back on the east side of the Mississippi after four months of misery on the northern extent or extreme of Vicksburg. And finally, he's in a position to attack. And at that point, he knows there's really nothing the Confederates can do to him. It's just going to be a matter of time, except the Confederates do try one more thing, which I think it was General Johnston coming over from Jackson, Mississippi, tries to attack Grant so that Grant won't have the time to keep up with this trench warfare approach to uh, encircling and finally attacking Vicksburg. And so what Grant does in a harbinger of General Sherman, who I'll get to in a second, Grant cuts his forces off from their logistics base and just chases after Johnston back to Jackson and says, live off the land to his men. And they managed to tear up all the railroad. They managed to prevent the Confederates from again uh, harassing them, and then they so they drive Johnston and his smaller forces east, and then they can return back to the siege of Vicksburg, which is completed and successfully emerges victorious on July 4th, 1863, the same time the Battle of Gettysburg has just wound down. So you have these two, it must have been a great July 4th in the north. Um, and Lee certainly thought it was pretty close to the end of the war, but we've still got two years to go. <laughs> Don't worry, you don't have two years to go in this talk. But, but, but um, and I've, I've already gone through five of the seven campaigns. But Grant knew something that other Union generals either didn't appreciate or failed to act upon, which was that the North had just way too much of an, of an advantage in manpower and materiel, that they, they just kept at it. It didn't even matter if they won the battles. Yes, it mattered that Vicksburg could be liberated because now the other part of the Northern strategy can be really kicked in that this anaconda strategy of cutting up the South into pieces that are not economically viable and can't really support a large Confederate army. So that part, I wouldn't really call a campaign. That was an ongoing four year effort with the naval blockade operation around Southern ports with the effort to take back the Mississippi, um, ultimately, uh, and I'll come to Sherman in a second, but taking Atlanta. So the, the South is getting chopped up into pieces that are not really viable to sustain a large army. But um, at this point, Grant's overall, Grant's overall approach is, is gonna be to now, now that he's been recognized as a general who knows how to do this, Lincoln and Stanton, Secretary of War Stanton, have understood that this is their guy. And so Grant is now rapidly promoted. He's never met Lincoln through this point and, um, uh, and only met Stanton and roughly you know, after the uh, Vicksburg liberation as well. And there, this is when Grant's becoming controversial. Some people think he's overrated. General McClernand doesn't like Grant much and says to Lincoln, or I think he writes him a letter and says, you know, Grant's known for his drinking. And I'm sure a lot of you know the punchline here, Lincoln says, well, could you figure out what kind of whiskey he drinks so I can send it to all the rest of my generals? And, and, it, and it's, also, uh, it's also the point where actually Grant revealed that he did have one big flaw, which is that he liked to race horses too much. And so after the liberation of Vicksburg, 
before Grant comes to Chattanooga, I won't talk about the Chattanooga battle, but that's an interesting one too. But before Grant starts to move east and then over to Union forces, he gets into this horse race with one of his buddies and he gets thrown off his horse and knocked unconscious. This is like the one guy you can't afford to lose, you know? And, um, and he spends several weeks in a hospital bed in September of 1863 before he's able to resume his generalship and get, get his promotions. And then ultimately, by the spring of 1864, he's become overall commander of Union forces. The, the sixth campaign is the big one. It's, it's uh, General Meade, the commander of the uh, Union forces in the east, in the Potomac region, with Grant traveling with him as the overall commander in chief of Union forces. And they begin the gradual southward movement, starting in Northern Virginia, in the general Culpeper area, and then going to places like Spotsylvania and the wilderness and Cold Harbor and Petersburg, and then ultimately weaving around and winding up at Appomattox the next spring. So it took a whole year to do that campaign. And most of the individual fights, the ones I just mentioned, the Union was losing statistically, suffering more casualties than the South. And, and this was a glum period. For those of you who remember the Civil War documentary, the Ken Burns, a uh, great documentary of 30 years ago, he was talking about this first half of 1864 as being among the glummest and most pessimistic in the North of the entire war. A part of that was the accumulated fatigue and carnage of three years of combat that produced more fatalities in the United States than all the rest of our wars combined. So this was an extraordinarily unfortunate and tragic and bloody war. But it was also this sense that nobody could quite see what was happening. And Grant didn't want to tell them. Because as Grant once said uh, about Lincoln, he said, you know, because Lincoln visited him during this campaign. He said, um, after the visit, he said, President Lincoln is the only person who ever had the right to ask me what my plans were next. And he was the only person who didn't. <laughs> everybody else, every journalist, every other general always wanted to know. And Grant kept his counsel fairly private because he knew his strategy was basically attrition warfare. Just keep pounding away. As the uh, great Civil War historian of a half century ago, ago Bruce Catton wrote, he was quoting Grant from Grant's memoirs. Uh, he said, the, this isn't the most beautiful English, but it gets the point across. He said, the enemy hath not army enough. In other words, if you keep pounding and you now cut the South into pieces, they just can't maintain this fight. There are six and a half million white Southerners. There are 20 million Northerners. So the disparity is just, and plus the industry is on the side of the North and Unlike Ukraine today, which suffers some of these same population disparities, there's no outside party helping the South. And the Union blockade is powerful enough to prevent that even if it were attempted. So they just keep pounding away. It takes a while, and there are some setbacks, but Lee's army is shrinking, and it can't be reinforced. And so now the strategy of do we take Richmond or do we destroy Lee's army, it sort of converges, and both happen finally at the same time in April of 1865. But that's the end of the sixth campaign. But the seventh campaign needs to be briefly mentioned and then I'm done. And the seventh campaign is of course Sherman's March to the Sea. But more importantly than the March to the Sea, which was after election day of 1864, it was Sherman taking Atlanta from the South because that completed the cutting up of the South into pieces. It gave a big win to the North and it saved Lincoln's reelection. Because at that point, George McClellan, retired General George McClellan, still only 37 years old, is running against Lincoln. And chances are if McClellan wins, which it looked like he would mm -hmm. through the summer, probably Mc McClellan negotiates uh, uh, an end to the war and accepts Southern secession and probably reverses Emancipation Proclamation. So uh, until the taking of Atlanta, to the extent you ever believe pollsters today or in 1864, uh, all the numbers were working against Lincoln. And as soon as Atlanta was taken, um, then he had a path to re-election, which basically guaranteed a Northern win. But there wasn't any guarantee of a Northern win until roughly September 1st, 1864, I would argue, which again gets back to one of my lessons, the outcomes in war are not preordained. So thank you for your patience on letting me bring you through a little bit of Civil War history, at least as I see it, uh, and also some of the lessons of this broader study. We can talk about any of the other wars you wish as well or apply this to today.
Uh, but I look forward to your reactions and your questions. Thank you. But I might just start off with one question because you've, uh, you've uh, offered the opportunity to speak about other wars as well. And that is since, since your book is a, uh, a, a book of lessons, <clears throat> but brilliantly told, it seems to me, you know, uh, narrative <clears throat> that, that, that points to what, why does it matter? And I think that's a, a very uh, useful and a great way to look at history. <clears throat> but what are some of the lessons that, and I realize that the forces are different and the balance is different. What are some of the lessons that one might draw for the Ukraine war right now from the American Civil War? And realizing that Ukraine is not a civil war at all. <clears throat> Thank you, Roy. It's a great question. Uh, I think there are a couple. One, you know, it's too late now, but the CIA should have known that a rapid Russian win was only a possibility, not an inevitability. And of course, I'm glad they acted with all due haste. And so on balance, I'm impressed with US intelligence and its role in this conflict. But it's still striking to me that they could get that wrong. They were wrong. And I've been wrong about things too. So uh, this is not meant to be uh, some big accusation as if it never happens in life. But you know what? If, if we thought this was becoming something that's easier to remember, let's think back to our own invasion of Iraq, where whether you were for it or against it, that's a separate debate. I don't think there was any excuse for thinking it would go fast. Part of it went fast, but we assumed away the difficulty of rebuilding a failed state that had just had its dictator removed from the scene. And our war plans for the Iraq war did not seriously focus on the stabilization of the country. So we just got to keep pounding into our minds this notion that war is rarely going to be as you expect. And of course, this goes back to von Moltke, the Prussian who said that, you know, like Mike Tyson, uh, war never survives for co first contact with the enemy. Mike Tyson said it just as well about boxing. It's the same principle. You know, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the nose. And um, it's just an age old verity. But to get to the current debate in 2023, you know, we should be wary of thinking we see accurately where this war is headed. Anything that's happening right now can change. That would be my first broad philosophical argument, and we certainly don't yet know who's going to win. There are ways in which uh, Ukraine could still lose. Now, what does that mean to lose? Does that mean that Russia could theoretically take all of Ukraine? That seems pretty unlikely, but I could still imagine the Zelensky government being deposed. They just lost a bunch of people in a helicopter crash, right, a week or two ago. Russians would have loved to engineer that with Zelensky aboard, and they might still try. So that's just one way in which this war could go badly uh, also, the Ukrainians who have been so impressive and whom I greatly admire, and I had the opportunity to travel to Ukraine in September and be in a small group meeting with Zelensky, and he's even more impressive in person, as I think a lot of us saw in his address to Congress. Unbelievable, inspiring person. And I can't say enough positive about him and the Ukrainian people, but there is a danger that they will get overconfident in thinking they can really liberate all their territory. I want them to have a chance at it, as I wrote in that op-ed, but I don't really expect that they'll necessarily achieve 100% expulsion of Russians from all their territory. So at some point, we've got to say, with the unpredictability of war, the fact that its outcomes are not foreordained, again, the lessons that occur to me looking at all this history, that if we decide to keep reinforcing Ukraine's battlefield efforts uh, I want to do that now, but at some point it could be a debatable proposition because we may be assuming that whatever momentum Ukraine has, it's going to keep. That's never a good assumption in war or in football or in, in any other human competitive endeavor. And, um, and so I think we've got to stay really sober about not rewarding Putin. You know, you got you to balance the sort of flexibility and negotiations with the fact that Russia and the, the whole idea behind this war, I think, must be decisively defeated in some sense. But I'm not sure that means that the Ukrainians can realistically expect to liberate all the terror, all the 17% of their country Russia still is on. 17%, it's a lot. And, uh, and the war has essentially been stalemated since October. So um, a lesson for me is 
don't assume just because you know one side has the momentum they're going to keep it, or that just because we now have seen the nature of recent battles that the future battles will resemble the past ones. There may be some innovations. In World War I, every year tended to look sort of like the year before until it didn't <laughs> in 1918. And so this could go on like this for a while until there's some concept that breaks through for one side or the other. Maybe Putin just goes nuts and decides to risk a higher level attack. Uh, I don't know. I don't, there are a lot of ways it could go, but I'm just pretty sure we haven't seen the last change in momentum. And that would be an important lesson from the, the history of all these wars I've seen myself or read about and studied. In uh, Ukraine, does a smaller country with a smaller army and a smaller population <clears throat> win a war of attrition against Russia, which is uh, so well equipped, so ar well armed, uh, and has such a much larger population? Drawing from your uh, example of uh, the, the Civil War, uh, which was, in a sense, a war of attrition. <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question, too. I don't know if they can win it in the sense of just pounding away indefinitely. Obviously, Zelensky is looking for a silver bullet. He wants every weapon he can possibly persuade us to provide in the hope that he can get those weapons and undertake integrated combined arms warfare that rapidly defeats the Russians and then somehow persuades Putin that that's the end of the road. I think the odds are against him with that aspiration. And more likely than not, we'll see back and forth, back and forth. Maybe a slight edge to Ukraine tactically, but Russia with the greater strategic depth. And so my sense is that the short answer to your question is probably not. But I would also say these two countries can maintain this fight a long time. For Ukraine, they need our continued help. And we've been providing a lot. And of course, that's going to get more politically contentious. And I'm a Democrat, but I will say this, if the Republicans and Congress want to ask tough questions by July about what our end game is, those are good questions to ask. Uh, I hope they won't cut off the funding while they're asking the questions. I think Ukraine has the noble cause and deserves our support. But at some point, those will be fair questions because I don't know that Ukraine can just fight this thing indefinitely and expect somehow to, you know, in the year 2028, finally win back all of its territory. Compared to World War I or the Civil War, as terrible as this conflict is, the casualty rates are lower per capita by quite a bit, which means in theory, in human terms, this war could go on a long time before the two sides run out of people to fight it. I, I want to push you a little bit on the extent to which these are military lessons as opposed to sort of international politics lessons, Yeah. right? So I, I um, was struck by, um, you noted that, um, Prudence among McClellan was sort of considered this bad thing. Hans Morgenthau in Politics Among, among Nations, he says prudence is the number one quality that a good international political thinker needs to, needs to keep sort of at the forefront of his mind. Um, so I guess to that point, to what extent are these sort of lessons, le lessons about how we've applied the military instrument incorrectly over the last few decades as opposed to we've made sort of the wrong international political decisions? No, I think that's a really smart question. And what I tried to do was to tell the chronology of these wars, including their strategic antecedents and causes. So I wasn't, the book's about seven wars. Uh, what I tried to do was to explain the wars in broader strategic context, and then explain how military strategy tried to serve the strategies and grand strategies of the combatants. So at that level, I was trying to blend military, technical issues, tactics, technologies, operations with strategic goals. That's, where the, that's sort of where the book resides, in that intellectual space. At least that was my goal. And so I take your point that quite often my lessons are not about whether you know, the Union should have dug deeper trenches or what have you, or whether we should have waited for a 50% larger army before going on the attack. And, and they're more about the application of military force in a strategic context. Uh, an int interesting point, by the way, just I thought of this, that um, Stephen Douglas, who of course had been Lincoln's nemesis in the Illinois Senate debates, and they had the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates, and by the way, who graduated from my hometown's high school in Western New York State in Canandaigua. Douglas, 
with only a few weeks to live, came to see Lincoln in April of 1861. And he said to Lincoln, you got to build up the army faster than you are. Because even though you are sort of the more you know, forceful of the two of us at challenging this, uh, you know, broader Confederate cause back when we debated, uh, at this point, you got a war on your hands and you better get ready for it. And you've spent the first few weeks of your presidency sort of dancing around trying to manage the politics. And that might have been the right thing. But now it's time to, to muscle up. And so... It's, it's at that kind of level of strategic analysis that I do try to draw most of my lessons. So I take your point. But I also, I also tried to study the military operations in detail enough to figure out if I thought there were any easier, more promising battle plans. In other words, if only we had better leaders in these wars, would we have done better? And I don't think that's really true. So maybe that, that is where the strategy, the high-end decision-making, and the military operations overlap, and you, and you wind up dis discovering that the most important lessons about military operations are not sort of helping the generals figure out how to do their job better, because they're pretty good at it. It's figuring out where the, the tools we have in our toolkit are going to be successful strategically. So yes, I think most of my lessons are more at that space between military operations and broad strategy. You know, a, that's a fair point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I want to bring this, as he did, back to the Civil War. And um, I'd like to ask a question about counterfactual history, um, because in, in some ways, counterfactual history, um, not, that he's, not that he's the most reliable scholar out there, but the historian Neil Ferguson talks a lot about the importance of examining counterfactual history. Now, what do you think was were the projections in Lincoln's head at the time um, in terms of you know, the various decisions that he made um, in terms of going up against um, the Confederacy, just in terms of manpower, in terms of the lethalness, because obviously um, the, the amount of casualties surprised the hell out of everybody um, at the time. So do you think that it was predicted and once it was predicted, um, do you think that Lincoln changed this calculus at all? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the kind words and the great question. And I think Lincoln was our greatest president. So if I sounded critical, it's only just because when you look back, you realize that there was a proclivity in this period of time, maybe based on our history, where everybody who fought the Revolutionary War was by now deceased. And people who fought the War of 1812, you know, the War of 1812 was fought with a 30,000 person U.S. military. And it, even though it lasted a while, it wasn't this kind of head-on-head -head heavy engagement for many years. And so there was sort of this naivete about war. And also Lincoln had to focus on the politics. You know, somebody once asked him, do you think God is on the Union side? And, and uh, do you hope so? And he said, well, I do hope that God is on our side, but what I really need is Kentucky, <laughs> not to mention Maryland. And, 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 and so that's where Lincoln's head was in the early months of 1861. And of course, he was only inaugurated in March. And then he tried to make sure the South would have to fire the first shots at Fort Sumter. And we know the rest of the story. But Lincoln had to be political in that period of time because the first order of business was to keep the Union unified and to get the border states to stay and then to keep Britain out. So I don't blame Lincoln for any of that. And of course, the, I think the War Department had 93 employees at this point. So in today's world, we would over-bureaucratize it and have you know, tens of thousands of people on the job. Back then, they probably had four people thinking about uh, you know, what a, a war might look like and how to mobilize. And pretty soon in the course of 1861, we had Monty Miggs, uh, quartermaster, doing a fantastic job. Lincoln r realized that his first Secretary of War, Simon Cameron, was sort of a bum. So he replaced him with Edwin Stanton. And so by we, the time we're getting into late 1861, 1862, Lincoln knows what he's up against. And so, you know, like with most things, very smart guy and didn't have a lot of support from within a big bureaucracy and figured things out often on his own and got to the right answer pretty quickly. But what still is striking to me is not so much, you know, that he made mistakes, but that this was the prevalent reflection of a lot of people, that this war was going to be quick and easy. And Lincoln himself thought maybe he wanted to believe the best of people. He really thought there weren't that many secessionists in the South and that he was quoted as saying, I think two or three regiments would probably be enough, two or three thousand people would be enough to stamp out the insurrection pretty quickly. 
So that's where his head was in the first half of 1861. But he, I think after Manassas uh, in July, he, like many others, learned that it was going to be a much tougher fight. And by the time we get into 1862, he, Grant, after the Battle of Shiloh, and others were coming to that realization in, in spades. So I'm not sure that's a complete answer to your question, but it's a good one. A good, good question. Thank you. And the question is, are there some military conflicts where a perpetual standoff might not be a better strat strategic outcome than a loss, notwithstanding popular opinion, of course? For example, with the West in terms of credibility, which, of course, Afghan civilians, especially in major cities, have been better off without, within relatively small force defending against the Taliban takeover for the foreseeable future. So is a longstanding standoff better? Well, I was a critic of President Biden's decision to pull out of Afghanistan. And I'm the one silver lining is that it went so fast. The Taliban takeover went so fast as we were departing that at least there wasn't a lot of bloodshed. There were not mass killings. However, half of Afghanistan's population now is at serious risk of starvation and the country is non-functional. So I can't really get myself to think that we're better off. Um, yeah, I think we could have stayed with 5,000 troops and probably sustained uh, an Afghan army that would have at least bought time for a peace process that maybe would have had autonomous zones, some for the Taliban, some for the government. I don't know. But I would have liked to try that rather than basically give up when we didn't have to. I, th I don't think we had to lose that war, but we did lose that war. The good news is, coming back to my third lesson, in grand strategic terms, you know, just as we lost Vietnam and it sort of doesn't matter anymore and we get along with Vietnam. And, and you know, I mean, it's, it's tragic. Obviously, people in this room may have family members who died in Vietnam or were permanently disabled. It's, it, it, it was a war that I wish had never happened. But if we step back, those lives were not necessarily given in vain because we did show a resilience, uh, a willingness to take on global communism when it was very expansionist. And in Afghanistan, we showed a willingness to spend 20 years trying to build something after 9-11, even though we ultimately couldn't do it. Uh, but we, we showed a lot of resolve. And I don't think the Taliban's going to come attacking us, because <laughs> I think they know that we would retaliate. They, they know that there's a toughness to the American people. And we just demonstrated that again. Uh, but um, yeah, I don't think the defeat served us well. So if the spirit of the question was, would I have wanted to stay in Afghanistan with a small presence and help hold on to the cities, the answer is yes. That was a very far-ranging and wide-ranging uh, discussion. Uh, but 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 that's we can blame you for that because your book is far-ranging and, uh, and very, very uh, detailed about <clears throat> uh, history. But uh, I have to tell people that uh, as one who's read about half of it, it is a very readable uh, account of uh, wars, and it makes it makes them not only come alive in terms of the narrative, <clears throat> but also in terms of uh, the sweep and and the lessons, uh, which is uh, I, I think extremely valuable. So thank you everybody for coming today. Thank you for your questions, uh, and uh, thank you. Just thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.